Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm going to be talking about Season 2 of Ben 10. I know it's been a really long time since I did a Ben 10 review, but I did promise you guys that I would review all five uh, seasons of the show. Uh, seasons of the show. Uh, I did keep that promise, but um, it's just um, got a lot on my plate these days. Uh, I still haven't decided whether or not I'm going to add Ben 10 Omniverse to my uh, reviews docket when it comes out in uh, September. A lot of that's going to basically depend on how I feel about the next couple of seasons of Ben 10, which I'm going to start uh, trying to knock out so that I can uh, make a decision about that. But anyway, let's talk about Season 2. Overall, I think that this was really a much, much stronger season than Season 1. A lot of episodes in Season 1 really just felt like filler. You could cut them out from the big mythology of the overall story arc of the season, and it really wouldn't matter. Like the episode with the uh, electric alien running amok at the small town tourist trap being a prime example of that. Here, we do see that to a bit, but overall, this is, I think, a much more focused season. I th there, are, there are, in many ways, a lot of genuine reasons for in terms of the mythology of the show for pretty much everything that we see going on here and we get to see a pretty decent bit of character growth we're introduced into some new characters we see some old characters come back and just all in all it's a big improvement over season one so let's uh, just get right into it talking about the characters and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the uh, mythology and plot uh, elements later on. Uh, the character that I really want to start off with is actually Max. Now the big thing from the end of the last episode of last season was of course that we finally, it was finally clear more or less what was going on with Max, that he'd been some sort of man, men in black sort of guy. And here of course in the first episode he lays it out that he was a part of um, the secret group called the Plumbers who did the whole men in black torchwood thing back in the day. And by doing this, they finally really allow Max to grow as a character. Now, granted, he'd been something of a... I don't know if mentor is exactly the right word for his relationship with Gwen and Ben in Season 1. He really was... He really was just doing what a grandfather should. He was looking out for their, his kid, grandchildren as best he could. He was providing them with moral guidance as best he could under the circumstances. But he was also, of course, hiding this really big secret from them. And you know, looking back at it, I can't help but wonder how much easier would this have all, would things have been in season one if he'd leveled with Ben and Gwen about what was going on much earlier. By you know having things out in the open, he's able to take a more active and useful role in helping Ben learn to be a hero, helping him deal with these threats, and genuinely sort of grow as not just a hero, but as a person. And I do like that as the season goes along, we do see Max acknowledge that Ben would have made a good plumber. And you can really see that this means a lot to Ben. Not that he doesn't really think that he doesn't have his grandfather's approval. It's obvious from what we see before that Max is very proud of Ben doing what he's doing. But here, acknowledging that Ben is someone who is worthy of this extraordinarily and honestly genuinely heroic path that Max has already walked, that's really means something to Ben, and that acknowledgement is something that Ben has had to earn, but by the time it comes, it's something that we as viewers can f honestly say, yes, Ben has earned that. Ben has done enough stuff, has grown enough as a person, that he is worthy of Max giving him that praise, of giving him that acknowledgement. Now, not that everything is 100% uh, great with what's going on with Max in this in this season. The episode with the crazy mask of the Mayan god whose name I'm going to even try and pronounce, that episode bothered me a little bit, 
Now, it's not that we haven't seen Max dealing with things that could potentially destroy the world. And yes, this is something from his past that really kind of had lingered on him. And yes, he was dealing with the Forever Knights, who he has um, has some history with and has a good reason to be upset with. But even with all that, I, I don't know if maybe just the writing in that episode was a little weak, or maybe it's just me. I just didn't feel that they sold the idea that Max would get so obsessed with this this weapon that he would genuinely ignore danger to his own grandchildren. That just really seems to go against everything that Max really stands for as a person. To me, it feels like watching the Watching Batman get so obsessed with catching the Joker that he willingly ignores that he's putting Robin in danger. Now, granted, you know, taking a teenage boy out to hunt psychotic murderers and criminals is not exactly the best thing you could probably do for their well-being, but... Well, anyway, I'm sure... I, I, think, I, I, think, I think my point has been made. So, I guess my criticism there would be I just didn't think that they sold me sufficiently on Max's motivation for becoming that obsessed. Now, your mileage may vary, but honestly, that really is basically my main gripe with what's going on with Max in terms of story in Season 2. For the most part, I really, as I said, really enjoy what's going on with him. He's a much more interesting character. Having him really step in and be able to fully utilize his experience and the technological resources at his disposal really just makes Max a much stronger and more interesting character. Now let's move on and talk about Gwen. Gwen has also also does a decent bit of growing this season and it's a lot of it is of course tied into her relationship with Ben. Now as we see this episode this season, yes, they still bicker and give each other a hard time and all that. But you know, it's it feels more just like what people and families do to each other, rather than the genuine animosity they seem to have towards each other at times in season one. Gwen, I think, has realized that despite uh, not really having powers, that she can still contribute. That she has. You know, intelligence and courage and resourcefulness on her side and that even though Ben is the one with the powers and Max is the one with the gadgets and the experience she can still be a part of this she can still do genuine good and just the fact that also Ben acknowledges that Gwen can contribute that he is willing to accept her advice to listen to her to take what she says seriously uh, look at the episode where she gets her lucky girl powers back. Uh, ben flat out says to her when Gwen asks him if he's jealous that he's not the only one that has powers anymore, he, he tells her, no, I'm actually glad to have some backup. And Ben is completely sincere in this. Now, well, sure, he does seem to have en enjoy doing what he's doing. He's also found himself a lot of time where he's in some really bad situations and there's nobody to help him. So it really makes perfect sense that he would do this. And as I said, Gwen uh, depending, being dependent on her resourcefulness and quick thinking, that the way that she helps deal with uh, Hex and Charmcaster in that episode show it perfectly. Gwen's greatest ability is that she is a very smart person, a very quick thinker, and that she can really hold her own in these situations reasonably well if if given the chance. Now, not always. There are some things that uh, are just simply out of her league. At the end of the day, Gwen is, of course, still just a 10-year-old girl. But, like Ben, she's growing she's becoming smarter, she's becoming more experienced. And I, I like that. It is. It keeps in the theme of what's going on with her, the entire Tennyson family. That they are growing, that they are changing. Ben and Gwen are moving in a direction to where they can become 
real heroes. Max is finally, you know, stepping out of retirement. You know, putting uh, putting the gloves or the goggles on, however you want to put it, one more time again, showing that he still has it, and of course, passing along his knowledge and experience to his grandchildren, so that um, well, basically, it, a lot of what we're looking at here is the journey towards passing the torch. That is really what we are looking at in terms of the overall storyline with the Tennyson family, and it's done, as I've said, really quite well. I also like this this, uh, this season. It seemed that um, they were a little bit more willing to show. I th and, and this is just my personal read. They're willing willing to show Gwen as being a little bit more fallible. We're willing to dial dial her arrogance down a little bit. But you know that's that's just my read on the thing. So let's get and wrap things up with the Tennyson family by talking about Ben. Now Ben. I really liked what's going on with Ben this season. In the first season, Ben, until the very end when Vilgax showed up and Ben realized just how serious things were, despite finding himself in some bad situations, Ben was mostly treating all of this like a game. Like he had woken up in some kind of a comic book or a video game and that, that he could just have fun with this. That he could really only take things seriously when he absolutely had to, not when he needed to. And we do see that uh, the fact that Ben does now have a genuine moral obligation to use his powers to do good has really started to sink in. He, we see more than once that Ben is frustrated by, not really by having his powers, but by the obligation that comes with them. With great power comes great responsibility. A classic superhero theme. And folks, it's no mistake that the people at Man of Action are all Marvel Comics veterans. With, of course, Marvel Comics being the home of the one and only Spider-Man. Seriously, the hallmarks of Spider-Man and Marvel and comic books in general are all over this series, as I've mentioned before. So we do see that. We see Ben at, t at times, especially in the um, Las Vegas episode, even just feeling that burden, it's like, I just want to enjoy my life and have fun. But here's this crisis in front of me. I can't turn away from this, no matter how much of a buzzkill it is. So, yeah, the, the burdens of being a hero, of having to accept the responsibility that comes with those powers, those, are, those do start to hit Ben. But I like to his credit, Ben Ben steps up. Ben doesn't really do a whole he does, you know, a little bit of minor complaining, but you know, of course he's a ten year old boy, and this is a lot to place on the shoulders of somebody who's in the fourth grade. But still, for the most part, Ben steps in and does these things, usually without a whole lot of pushing, without a lot of prodding, without a lot of angsting. And again, part of it is because he likes being a superhero, he likes beating up bad guys, but also because of the way things have happened, he has realized that this is something that he does have to take seriously. That being a superhuman, being a superhero, can't be all fun and games. And for the most part, I think Ben accepts that this aspect of his of his life with um rather rather well. I, I think he takes it rather well. I think he accepts this surprisingly well for someone his age. Now, not that we don't see Ben being goofy and being irresponsible and, you know, just using his powers to, like in the Niagara Falls episode, he uses his powers to make money, giving rides to tourists as Stinkfly. And we also see in the very early on that Ben is also susceptible, susceptible to things like having his ego flattered, of wanting fame, of wanting praise and acknowledgement from people who he thinks, like, who he admires, like his uh, grandfather's old partner in the plumbing business. So Ben does have these vulnerabilities. And again, this sort of goes back to uh, the very early origin of Spider-Man, where he ignores the, a thief 
because one, the guy at the TV station, at the um, basically a guy tried to. Uh, Oh, well, hell, why am I explaining this to you? you? We all know the origin of Spider-Man at this point, right? So anyway. But uh, my big favorite moment, of, not surprisingly, for Ben this season, came at the very end where he's been uh, shunted off to the, you know, let's call a spade a spade, where he's basically exiled to the Phantom Zone. The Null and Void. I prefer to call it the Phantom Zone. It's much more fun. So anyway, we're gonna—that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna call it the Phantom Zone, where he's trapped in the Phantom Zone with Kevin Eleven and Vilgax, and Gwen comes in to rescue him. And Vilgax and Kevin sh display um, some remarkably competent bad guy bad guying, and it really looks like Ben is going to be trapped there in the Phantom Zone forever with them. Or worse, that they're going to get their hands on the Omnitrix and can do who knows only what with it. And at the end of it all, Ben, it, we were shown that Ben is in fact willing to give up the Omnitrix. He is willing to sacrifice this thing which makes him special. And being special is that thing that really more or less defines so much of who Ben is in his own mind. And more importantly, Ben is willing to sacrifice power. I'm trying to think of a, a quote that basically, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't think of that. There was a quote that was on the tip of my tongue, but I completely lost it. Uh, but it was something along the lines of, about how, how someone in history, and I'm, I'm really blanking on the names here, had acquired a great deal of power, and somebody was saying, if this person was willingly relinquish this power that they have and you know be given then that would make them a better person than most and that is what Ben does Ben is willing to sacrifice that which makes him special that which gives him power for the greater good in order to save Gwen and to keep this power away from people who would misuse it and we do see, of course, at the very end of the episode that Ben does get the Omnitrix back, and we're given that very cool transformation sequence as an obvious acknowledgement that Ben indeed, Ben has indeed grown even further as a hero this season. That he has indeed, and in looking at that um, sequence at the very end, there is, really is no other way to say it, but... It is there to acknowledge that Ben has indeed become a true hero. Because while you can debate what makes a hero a hero back and forth, I've noticed over the years that the one constant that people seem to agree on when they try to define what a hero is, is that a hero is someone who is willing to sacrifice. And as I said, Ben was willing to sacrifice in a very big way for his family and for the greater good. And it is very, because of that, is why it's so very satisfying to see him get that acknowledgement at the end of being a true hero. Now, uh, let's briefly talk about our uh, main villains this season, which are, uh, once again, Vilgax, who only pops up again at the very end. Uh, as I said, he and Kevin do some very competent villaining together, but also they are they're they're good at beating down on Ben. But the the instant they try and get anything done with each other, of course, they're instantly snapping each other and backbiting it, and that's of course what sinks the whole plan. That neither one of them can really bring themselves to give even an inch, even when it is very blatantly obvious that uh, a little bit of give would serve them both far, far better than just constantly the whole, you need to show me some respect, Buster. So, overall, I don't really think that there's a huge amount to say about Vilgax this season. Uh, Kevin, there's a little more. He, I, his um, desire for revenge against Ben, well, it is understandable that and his butting heads with Vilgax are really all he has going for him. Now, granted, K 
Kevin's an 11 year old boy, so I don't really expect a huge amount of a deep, complex Freudian motivation or anything like that from him. But still, it, he just seems very, very, very one note. It's just basically, I want to get Ben. That's it. That's all Kevin really has going for him in terms of his character. And I just, I just didn't feel terribly, terribly satisfied in that regard. So let's um let's briefly talk about the uh, overall plot of this season. As I said, it is does mostly focus on the Tennysons in their own way, each becoming better better people morally, better better heroes in general. I I was was genuinely bothered though by the uh, Gwen Ten episode. Now, like a lot of you guys watching this season the first season, I of course wondered, well, I wonder what it would be like if Gwen had been the one to find the Omnitrix. And the way she acts in season one, how she's, you know, much more level-headed, rational about things, would seem to indicate that if she'd been the one to find the Omnitrix, that she'd have been, well, a more responsible hero than Ben would. Better is such a, such a subjective subjective term that I don't really want to go there. So when we do finally see this in the um, what if slash imaginary story episode, we see that not only that Gwen is, once she puts on the Omnitrix, instantly better at using all of these aliens' powers than Ben was. Ben even says, how did you do that? It took me months to figure out how to do that. Or weeks or something like that. And this bothers me for for one reason. And let me explain to you what that is. Now, it's, it's made very obvious that Gwen is an extremely smart person. But here's the thing about smart people. That being smart doesn't mean that you're instantly good at things, especially things you have never done. For example, let's say you grab somebody with a really high genius IQ, something like 160. That's firmly in the range of genius. And then you grab someone of an average IQ, which is clocks in at, not surprisingly, 100. Now let's say that you give each of these people a violin and ask them to play something, the same piece of music. And let's also say that neither one of these people has ever played the violin before in their life. Now that person with the 160 IQ is unlikely to be any better at playing the violin than the person with the 100 IQ. Being smart does not automatically make you good at something. Now if you're smart, maybe you'll figure out how to be good at it faster. But again, that's a maybe. And even very smart people can't don't know how if it can't be good at everything. There are limits, and everyone has them. So, just the fact, just the idea that because Gwen probably has a higher IQ than Ben, that she would instantly be able to figure out how to use these alien superpowers, it just doesn't really ring true. And it, frankly, it just, it, it, even worse, it just doesn't plain make any sense. So, it really, that really bothered me. You know, I could, I, I could kind of go on with this, but I think I'd really just sort of be going around in circles. So I think I've made my case on that, my stated my case on that particular aspect of the, of this. That I've made my case. I think I've made it reasonably well. I'm going to leave it at that. Now, uh, the overall storyline of this season, as I said, it is pretty much about the Tennyson's growing as a family, becoming better better heroes, becoming better people, and I do like that. I do like that this family cohesion is a very subtle but obviously underlying episode, I'm sorry, plotline theme of this season. And I also like the fact that they don't really go out of their way to beat me over the head with, we're a family, we're learning to be better heroes together. I like that there is some subtlety, that there is, that not everything is needs to be spelled out for me.
but it is there if only you're willing to look for it and give what you're looking at a little bit of thought. So folks, I'm going to wrap start wrap I'm going to wrap things up here. Overall, season 2 of Ben 10, big improvement over season 1. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to be happening in season 3. Um as I said, still haven't made up my mind if I'm going to be reviewing Ben 10 Omniverse. We'll see how things uh, shake out. Anyway, with that said, folks, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And, of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. Until next time, take care and have a good one.